Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK. Welcome to my channel. Um, I want to talk about death of a lifestyle um, because what we're going through is like death of a loved one or how we feel or how a terminally, terminally ill patient would feel knowing that they're going to die. Um, so if it's the first time you're passing through, you can click the thumbs up, thumbs down, you can subscribe and you can share and you can, yeah, that's basically it. I just want to thank all my subscribers. Yeah, so um, this is based off of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who, who was a, who, well, she's dead now, but she was a Swiss-American psychiatrist or psychologist, psychologist. And she actually wrote a book called On Death and Dying, which was a bestseller. And she kind of went through, well, she believed that everyone goes through five stages of grief um, when they're either terminally ill or when they are close to, or when somebody close to them dies. Now, why I'm, I'm putting... Why I'm talking about that in relation to what we're going through with this new change of lifestyle due to the coronavirus is because this is death of a lifestyle and it's happened so suddenly. It's like our lives have suddenly been taken away from us. So we are going to go through those five stages that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, talks about. And... <clears throat> If you don't know about the five stages, you might think you're going crazy. You might think you're overreacting. You might think that what you're going through is abnormal. You might have really, really bad thoughts and think, oh, my God, am I going crazy? And all, the reason why I'm doing this video is to take you through those five stages so that you know that what you're going through is very normal. Lots of people have lost their jobs. That's death of a lifestyle. Lost their jobs, some on the verge of losing their homes. And so the first stage is, is denial. The thing is, is that when we started hearing about the coronavirus in China, we denied it, we pushed it to the back burner. It's not here, we don't have to worry about it. It's in China. Then we heard it kind of trickling to other countries and we're like, it's not here. It's not in the UK. We don't have to worry about it. We denied it, its existence. We denied the impact. When we looked at China's lockdown, we thought, oh, gosh, we're all, we're all kind of making our little comments. And now it's here in the UK. And some of us are still in denial. They can't, I can't believe this is happening. I've heard people say it's so surreal. I feel as though I'm in a movie. And, you know, it, it is. That's the first stage. You just cannot. You're kind of in a state of shock as well. So you, you can't just get to grips with it. And you're not really thinking what's going to happen two days or two months down the road because you are still in denial. So that's the first stage. And you're saying, this is not happening to me. Everything will be OK. I don't need help. And um, that is what it's like. So that's the denial stage. The second stage is anger. You suddenly realise that it is happening. And then you get mad at everybody. You start blaming everybody. You know, when people are dying, they, they blame people who um, maybe didn't help them or somebody who um, they blame the doctors or they start blaming God. A lot of people at this point start blaming God, even though all of these disasters are man-made. God hasn't got anything to do with it. But you will find, oh, how will God let this happen? How's God going to let so many people die? How's, you know, how's it? It's not about that. The thing is, is that we get warnings all the time and we constantly ignore them constantly ignore them and you know sometimes people just think life is going to go on as usual 
oh yeah, I'm not going to do this. I can wait. I can leave that until next year or a couple of years down the line. I'm not going to pay this off because I can pay that off in a couple of months' time, a couple of years' time. I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to go on holiday, and I'm. It doesn't really matter about this debt. It doesn't matter if I don't pay my rent. It doesn't really matter about this or that because I can pay it in a couple of weeks' time. I can pay it in a month's time. That's how people think. They don't think. Just supposing everything changes, what am I going to do? Just supposing I, you know, like those people, like I was talking about on the plane, just supposing I don't, I, I've used up all my money and I don't get to get reach my destination and I'm stuck in a country without any money. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's about not thinking ahead and expecting the world to um, succumb to your agenda. It's almost like you're telling the world, you're telling the universe, it's okay, uh, you can be on hold. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. Um, when I've done all this and that, then you can come and do what you want to do. It doesn't work like that. The universe has got its own agenda. And so have people and the two conflict a lot of the time. And we humans are stuck in the middle taking the brunt, which is what has happened now. So uh, you're paralyzed with shock. You're, you, you've gone through this denial phase. You're angry now. It's not fair. You're looking for people to blame, regardless of whether um, they deserve the blame or not. You'll find somebody to blame to take the onus and the responsibility of yourself for not managing your life and your situation a little bit better. In some cases, you just cannot. In some cases, your money is so tight, you just cannot forward plan. You just cannot save. You just, you know, we're all like that. You know, like I said, you know, I've had money and then I, I go and spend it thinking, OK, I can build it up. And a lot of us do that. I can build it up down the road. I can do this. I can do that. We do that all the time. And then boof, something like this hits you and you're like, bloody hell, what am I going to do? So, yeah, so this is anger. You're angry at God because, you know, you're losing your house. You're going to be on the street. You haven't got a job. You know, you're, you know, you're, fat, you're arguing with your family. You, your friends have deserted you and you start blaming on God when God hasn't got anything to do with it. We have to take responsibility for our position, the position that we are in. You can't be blaming God for every for everything. And the government, yeah, to a certain degree, they've been mollycoddling us for all our bloody lives. A lot of people who are on the dole have been mollycoddled. And so they 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 didn't realize they were being money coddled. They didn't realize that the rug was going to be pulled from underneath their feet. They're just going on on their merry way. Oh, it don't matter if I don't pay the rent. It don't matter about this. It don't matter about that. You know, I wonder how many of people on the dole thought, even if I save five pounds and scrimp, five pounds a week. You know, in a few years' time, I'd have X amount instead of going and buying cigarettes. I'm going to sacrifice this pack of cigarettes because they are expensive. And yet you find people on the dole smoking. But supposing they had that foresight. But a lot of us, we don't think ahead. We don't think like that. So we're in a situation now where a lot, we've got a lot of angry people around and these angry people are going to start taking it out on everybody else. They're going to start blaming their spouses. They're going to start blaming, blaming their bosses for not keeping their jobs open. They're going to blame the government. They're going to blame everybody they can blame. And they're going to work themselves up in such a tizzy that they are going to make themselves crazy. Then what will happen? You go into the bargaining phase that's the next stage the bargaining stage is where you say if you give me one more chance god if you just give me one more chance if you just take this coronavirus away i promise i'll pay this i promise i won't put myself in debt i promise 
that I'll be good. I promise I won't do this at work. I prom You start bargaining with God usually. But for those who don't believe, they somehow find somebody to talk to who is invisible, but who they want to hear so they're not holding it inside. So we've reached a bargaining stage. You know, I'd be a better person if only you let this stage go over. You know, if I, only I can get through this, I'll do this and I'll do that and blah, blah, blah. So, and then you get into the depression stage because then you're thinking, oh my God, you know, God isn't listening to me. He hasn't listened to my prayers. You know, I've still lost my job. I've lost my home. My family is broken up. I can't go anywhere. I've got no money. And you go into depression. Because now you're in reality. Now you've got to face reality. This is really happening. The impact of what the government is doing is happening. And all of these little things that they say they're putting in self, all these rescue packages, it's not feasible. Unless they gave everybody a blanket amount of money for equality purposes and said, OK, three months, here's five grand. Well, maybe three, you know, that's a bit too generous. But, you know, everybody gets 3,000, right? And then once it all sorted out, those who have a certain echelon or have a certain salary coming in and who don't really need it or are working, it's their responsibility to pay it back and give it back. That would be the proviso under which everybody would get some money to tide them over at least three months. But that's not happening. If this was a fair and, you know, they thought this thing through, that's what they would be doing. But instead, it's, it's getting you back. It's getting you back for not paying your taxes. It's getting you back for being on the dole. It's getting you back for being a nuisance. It's getting you back for all of the things that you've done, even though you haven't done it wittingly. In the, in the government's eyes, all of the perceived wrongs that have been done to them, why they can't make as much money as they would like to make, this is the result. They now feel as though, look, you know, you haven't been contributing sufficiently to the economy. So therefore, now it's time for us to help you. We're not going to help you. And a lot of people have come to that realisation that now when they need the money and they need some support, the government isn't there to help them. All those people who were looking down on people on the dole and finding themselves in a similar position, it's not a good feeling. And so, you know, we have to kind of, all I'm saying is that when you reach that realisation that you are in trouble, big trouble and that'll be the majority of us are in trouble might not be this week or next week but in a couple of months time we're all in trouble and then you'll realize oh, a lot of you will say why bother i'm not going to try i've had enough this is you know you know my life is over everything's finished uh, you know, I can't, I can't get, I can't see beyond this. And you go into a stage of depression. And then hopefully, you know, just like death, just like even though you never get over the death of your mother or your father or your grandmother, somebody who's really, really close to you or your grandfather, you reach a stage of acceptance. They passed on. I'll never, ever see them again. And the same way with this particular situation, you'll reach a stage of saying, sooner the better, OK, this is a situation. It's no point me moping about it. What can I do? How can I make things right for me? So this has happened. This has happened for a reason. I can't change what's happened. I'm going to be okay. 
I just need to make adjustments. And that's what this whole process everybody will be going through, except for the rich and the famous, of course. But everybody will be going through those five stages, sometimes seven stages. There's five days, stages of grief. But in some cases, they show seven stages. But the seven stages, I think the other one was shock. And um, testing. Seeking a realistic solution. So when there's seven stages, you'll reach a stage after depression when you start testing different kinds of ways to deal with your situation and your kind of, um, you know, you might test trying to, you know, like some people, they might try to start making cakes for people. At times like this, this is when you know that people have a need. And yes, we are supposed to be socially distancing. Well, we are, we must socially distance. But at the same token, this is where your imagination will say, what can I do to help someone else? Some people have started cooking um, videos. Some people, because of all of this, some people have done games. Some people are showing um, what they're doing at home, you know, ways they're spending the time at home by themselves. And, you know, they're doing things like that. They've started already to get through get through something. And yes, admit, it's a lot of the times it's the younger people whose minds are more agile. But just because you're older, don't let your brain slow you down. Don't let those grey cells start taking hold of you. There are still things that you can do. The same way that those people thought about doing those YouTube videos to make people laugh or to what, you know, to get them through each day. You know, that's, it's the same thing. You, you might not be a YouTuber, but there might be something else. This is a time when you sit back and think to yourself, dig deep. What am I good at? What can I do? How can I help someone else? And helping someone else, you help yourself. And in some cases, you, you know, if you can help somebody, you charge them. It all depends on what it is. But anyway, that's all I've got to say, and I hope you found this useful. Bye-bye.